All right, in the last class, we were in basically John chapter 16, and we were talking about Christ's promise that when the Comforter is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And we covered the Holy Spirit uh, convicting the lost. You know, he, he says he will reprove the world, okay, which means he is going to convict or convince, persuade the lost. That's the world. It's not believers, but lost people. He'll convict and convince them regarding sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Okay, Christ said of sin because they believe not on me. Um, lost people need to understand when we give them the gospel, they need to understand that they are sinners in the sight of a holy God. They may not be sinners according to their fellow religionists or anything like that, but in the sight of Almighty God, they are sinners. Their sin is going to condemn them to hell forever. The only way that they can remedy that situation is to receive righteousness, and righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him. So of sin and of righteousness, righteousness is required for entrance into heaven. But we have no righteousness. We're sinners. We are lost, undone, completely without hope. So Christ came. He died for us. He paid our sin debt and extends to us, us the offer of His righteousness. And if we will receive that, then we are saved by His grace. If we'll simply trust Him as our Savior. Okay, so of sin, of righteousness, and... Uh, most of that we covered in Romans chapter 3. And I'll tell you what, let's go back there real quickly, okay? Um, there is a lot of controversy among professing Christians as to the role of righteousness in salvation and how do we attain to that righteousness. Uh, there are those who seem to believe that if they will clean up their own life, that they can contribute to what Christ has done and uh, will help to save themselves. Uh, there are those who, who would change the word believe to mean believe and surrender, believe and make a commitment, believe and obey. Uh, and, and that's just not true. The word believe means believe. Okay, it's a very simple proposition. Um, so in Romans chapter 3, uh, for instance, in verse 22, it says, even the righteousness, well, let's read 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, this was known in the Old Testament. This isn't something new. It's not that they were saved by law in the Old Testament and now we're saved by grace through faith. No, we were always saved by grace through faith. This is, is coming from the Old Testament, Paul says. Even the righteousness of God, okay? Not your righteousness, not my righteousness, okay? The truth is, and we've seen earlier in Romans chapter 3, that we are not righteous. Verse 10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Okay, righteousness is necessary, and you don't have any, and I don't have any, and no one has any but God himself. So the righteousness of God is witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, verse 22, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all, them that believe. If you believe in Christ, the righteousness of God is bestowed upon you. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus and He gives you His righteousness as the means for your salvation. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All mankind has the same problem. We are sinners and by our sin we are separated from God, so there's only one solution and that is the righteousness of God given to us through faith in Christ. Being justified freely, which means for nothing. You don't pay anything to get this justification. Justified means to be declared righteous. 
being justified freely by His grace, unmerited favor, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, that means a satisfactory payment. When you make your last payment on whatever it might be, a house, an automobile, or something, you have now satisfied the debt that you owed. The previous owner, the seller, is now satisfied and you become the owner of that property. So God set forth Christ to be a complete and satisfactory payment through faith in His blood. Okay, we have to remember it was the blood of Christ that paid our sin debt before God and satisfied God to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Uh, let's skip a couple of verses here and let's just go down to verse 28. We covered this last week, but I'm just trying to, to you know, get, put this in your mind. I had a teacher in Bible college who said that repetition is theological mucilage. Now mucilage, I don't know if you've ever heard that term in India, but mucilage is an old-fashioned word for glue. Okay, so repetition is theological glue. Okay, give it to them over and over and over again until it sticks. Okay, uh, so verse 28, therefore we conclude. Paul says, here's the conclusion, and remember, he is writing by inspiration of the Spirit of God. This is absolutely true. It's not a matter of controversy for Christians. Okay, this should be settled once and for all. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay, without the deeds of the law. Apart from, completely without the deeds of the law. It's not necessary to have good works before you trust Christ. It's not necessary to have good works after you trust Christ in order to get to heaven. You are saved by the grace of God through faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and that he was raised from the dead. And if you trust in him, he saves your soul. You should do works after salvation. God wants you to do works through, after salvation. He works in your heart to, to get you to do works for salvation. Um, Philippians, Paul declares it's God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay, so the conclusion is you are declared righteous by Almighty God when you put your trust in Christ. And it has absolutely nothing to do with your works, with your attempts to be righteous, whether it's before or after the moment of salvation. Okay, so he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and then he convicts us of judgment. And this we did not cover last week. Um, so let's go back to John 16 and John 16 and verse 11, it's on the right page here, uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Okay, this is, is uh, a repetition of something that Christ had said basically the same thing in John chapter 12 and verse 31 he says now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out and I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me this he said signifying what death he should die okay the prince of this world is the devil Satan himself he was judged at the cross okay he is condemned. He has no hope. He will be cast into the lake of fire eventually. Okay, but for now, he's loose on this earth and doing a terrible job. I mean, he's working against the Lord. He's working against God's people and doing awful things. Um, but he has been judged. Well, we are the devil's followers until we come to Christ. Lost people, most of them don't know it, but they are dead in their trespasses and sins. The, the devil, 
the God of this world works in their hearts. Um, when we trust Christ, we are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Okay, the devil is, is the head of that kingdom, so we were his, um, his subjects. Okay, well, if, if the king of this world, or the prince of this world, or the god of this world, as the devil is called, if he has been judged by Almighty God, then it is nothing to believe that his followers also will be judged. And so we are to tell people uh, in our gospel presentation, and the Holy Spirit will convict them or convince them of this truth, that there's a judgment to come. And they will not escape it except through Jesus Christ. He is the only hope. That's why he said that if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. Okay? You'll, you'll die in your sins and be held accountable for those sins by God. Um, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Uh, well, let's read verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so Satan is cast into the lake of fire. And then he says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you and I will not be judged at this great white throne judgment because our names are in the book of life because we've trusted Christ. And so we will not be there. It is the dead, those who don't know the Lord, who are being judged at this point, and every single one of them is cast into the lake of fire. They are judged by their works, which prove that they are sinners, that they have no hope of salvation, and uh, then they're cast into the lake of fire. Okay, there is no remedy at this judgment. Everyone that is present there is cast into the lake of fire. All right, so the Holy Spirit has been sent by God to the earth. He is our comforter. He is the one who has been given to us to help us. He gives us power to serve the Lord and power to preach the gospel. And he works in the hearts and the minds of lost people to convince them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, I really think that, that a requirement here is that they hear the gospel. If they don't hear the gospel, um, well, they can't be saved. They have to hear the truth of the Word of God regarding salvation in order to be saved. As we witness, we can have the knowledge that the Holy Spirit is present with us. He actually lives in our body. And as we give the gospel to lost people, He will convict them, convince them, persuade them of the truth of it. That doesn't mean every person is going to heed, but they will be able to understand. They will be able to comprehend. And uh, unfortunately, many will decide not to trust Christ, but many will. Okay, so we've been talking about the promises of God given regarding the Great Commission. Now, I'd like you to take your Bibles, and we're still talking about the idea of power. Okay, but I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, and I'm going to cover, hopefully, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to cover a lot of Scripture. Um, just about all of chapter 3 and then the first several verses of chapter 4. Uh, they all go together and they, they 
all have to do with this idea of where does our power come from? When we serve the Lord, when we do anything in the ministry, when we reach out to help people, when we witness to people or preach to people, when we try to do anything for the Lord, where's our power from? Okay, and it comes from the Lord himself. It comes from the Spirit of God. So let's start off. Uh, and a lot of chapter 3, I'm going to try just to read and not make too much comment. Okay, but I want you to get the context of this. So starting in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit, of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward." Okay, he's looking back on his ministry to the Corinthians, and he says that you are an epistle written by the Spirit of the living God in, in your heart. Okay? Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God. Sometimes Christian people are tempted to feel like they are sufficient in themselves. Why? You know, I'm brilliant. I'm attractive. I have a pleasant way of speaking. I have a good voice. Um, I have a high education. I have this. I have that. I have the other thing. And we get to feeling like, you know, boy, I'm really somebody. And it's almost like we think God's lucky to have us to do his work. Um, but he says here, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Okay, every one of you gentlemen taking this course is different. You all have different talents, different abilities, different appearances, different levels of education. Your uh, social and economic background could be completely different from one another. You know, I don't know any of these things since I don't know you personally. But every person is unique. And then God saves your soul. He gives you the Holy Spirit to live within you. He gives you spiritual gifts that differ one from another. You gentlemen, um, if you are called uh, to preach, then you have the gift of pastor-teacher or the gift of evangelist, perhaps. Um, do we think, though, that because of our innate abilities, you know, some of you may be just as sharp as a pack. Boy, things come to you easy, quickly. Others of you, maybe going to school is just a tremendous chore. You have to work and work and work to make things stick, okay? What do we do? Do we say, oh, I'm sufficient of myself. I can do this and that and the other thing. No. We are not sufficient of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Every one of us needs to remember that. Some of you, perhaps, there's some of you thinking, well, I am insufficient to do the ministry. Well, congratulations. We all are insufficient. Okay, you may be thinking, well, I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not bright enough. I'm not, you know, whatever. But our sufficiency comes from God. If God's called you, you have his help. Who also, verse, verse 6, and this is a great verse, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, the New Covenant. God has made you, if God has called you, then he is enabling you for the ministry. Okay, that's very, very important for you to understand. You can go out and do the work of God with tremendous confidence that God is working in you and through you, and he will make you able. Whatever God wants you to do, he's got the grace and the power to enable you to do it. But if the ministration of death, oh, let me finish the verse, okay? Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now the letter is the law of Moses, which condemns. 
but the Spirit gives life. Okay, life comes through the Spirit of God making us born again when we trust Christ, when we believe the gospel. So if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, you know, in this age, we don't have something like, you know, Mount Sinai where Moses goes up for 40 days and 40 nights and he comes down and his face is glowing because he's been in the presence of God all this time. Oh, we don't have that. You've never seen that happen to a preacher. I never have either, and you won't. Okay? But our ministry is more glorious than that ministry. May, Moses' face may have shined, okay? But our ministry is more glorious. We have the ministry of life. What Moses gave to the people condemned them. Okay? The law condemns because it proves we're sinners. But the gospel of grace saves. Okay, so our ministry is far more glorious. If the ministry, verse 9, if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. The law condemns grace. The gospel of grace extends an offer of righteousness. You may be justified before Almighty God through faith in His Son. Oh, my goodness. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by the reason of the glory that excelleth. It's like the glory of Moses' face fades away in contrast to the glory of the gospel of Christ, the free gift of salvation offered freely to every person who will take it by faith. Okay, that is a marvelous thing, far more glorious than the law of Moses. For if that which is done away, and remember, the law has been done away. We are not under the law any longer. It, well, if that was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious, and grace remains. Seeing then that we have such hope, such anticipation, such expectation of the blessing of God being with us and upon us and working in us and through us as we minister, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now this word plainness can mean boldness, or it can mean being plain spoken. Being very careful that everything you say is true, and that it is the best way to give the truth that you can, can find. Okay? Um, a lot of preachers if you go to school long enough, you end up with this vocabulary that nobody understands but the theologians. Okay, well, if you have a ministry of trying to win theologians to Christ, uh, first, of, uh, first of all, good luck, because most theologians are dead set against the gospel. But you're not reaching theologians. You're reaching common people, ordinary people. The world is full of ordinary people who need to hear the gospel in a way that they can understand it. Okay, so having such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Cultivate small words. Cultivate a vocabulary that doesn't confuse anybody when you give the gospel. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we get on into the nitty-gritty of sharing Christ with people. Okay, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Okay, Jewish people have a veil upon their hearts because they have rejected Christ. Okay, that's a shame. But just like they put a veil over Moses' face to hide his face from the people because they couldn't stand the light, today there's a veil over their faces, uh, keeping them from hearing and understanding. Um, nevertheless, 
when it, which is Israel, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. There is an expectation for Israel to be saved because God has promised, okay? And uh, you can see more about that in Romans chapter 11. Uh, now the Lord is that Spirit. You may have noticed that He has mentioned the Spirit several times here. Um, verse 3, the Spirit of the living God. Verse 6, the Spirit giveth life, and so on. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay? There's liberty uh, in the Holy Spirit. Now what is liberty? Well, we won't turn to it, but uh, on your own, go to Galatians chapter 5, beginning, I think it's with verse 13, and it tells us that um, we should not use our liberty as an excuse for sin, but instead we should use it to serve Christ. Okay, that's what liberty is for. It's liberty from sin to serve God. I don't know how it is in India, but I know in America there are an awful lot of people who profess to be Christians, and maybe some of them are, who seem to believe that Christian liberty means that there are no standards of behavior that we need to follow. Um, I remember one guy who actually said there are no commandments in the New Testament, which is absolute nonsense. There are commandments all over the place. We see them everywhere. God tells us how to live, and if God speaks and says, this is what you should do, beloved, that's a commandment. It's not a suggestion, okay? Uh, it's a commandment from God. It doesn't have to be chiseled in stone to be a commandment. Um, okay, so where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, freedom from sin. The Bible tells us that we have been set free from sin in Romans chapter 6. We have been set free from the law in Romans chapter 7. Okay, so we have liberty to serve the Lord. We have liberty to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, verse 18, and this is a verse that kind of tends to get passed over when, when people are studying or preaching 2 Corinthians, and I really think this is a very, very important verse. Um, but we all, with open face, remember Israel had a veil over their face, but we don't. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the word glass there means mirror. Okay, so what is he talking about when he says, beholding as in a glass? Well, let's go over to James chapter 1. Remember, when we study the Bible, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay, the Bible interprets itself. Um, okay, um, verse 23, Roman, uh, pardon me, James chapter 1, verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay, he says in 23, we're beholding in a glass. We're looking into a mirror. Verse 25 says we're looking into the perfect law of liberty. Okay, and then here in 2 Corinthians 3, he says, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Okay, so what is this glass that he's talking about? I think it's obvious it's the Word of God. We look into the Bible, and God wants us to study and meditate upon His Word every single day. Okay, in Psalm chapter 1, He commends us to look into the Word, meditate thereon day and night. Um, 
Study the Bible. Make it a habit. Read it. Pray over it. And spend time thinking, what does this mean and how does it apply to my life? Well, as we do that, as we look into this glass, according to James chapter 1, we see ourselves. Okay, the Bible reveals what mankind really is. Okay, and it's not so good. Okay, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? All right, so the Bible reveals us, but it also reveals God. It reveals the character and the nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, and he says that we behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We see the glory of the Lord Jesus. And we are changed into that image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so we, we look into the Bible, we meditate on it, we see ourselves, and we see a lot of things that need changing. We see a lot of things in us that are not good, that are not what they ought to be. We also look into the Bible and we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit absolutely holy, completely perfect, full of love and grace and mercy and compassion. And we see that, well, here's something, someone that we ought to be like. We see the nature of God. And so the Spirit of God, notice the last phrase there, by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, who's been given to us to live within our bodies, has... He's been given for a number of purposes, but one of the main things is to move us from the way we are to the way we ought to be. So to make us less like ourselves and more like Christ. And so the Spirit of God is working in us to do that. Now, beloved, the Scripture commands us to not grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, every single believer, to some extent, resists the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. The less you resist, the more like Christ you become. The more, like, the more you resist, the more like yourself you remain. Okay, still born again, still a child of God. If you were not a child of God, you wouldn't have the Holy Spirit inside you working on you. Okay? So God is at work in us to make us like Christ. And that is, again, part of the power of God which was given to us when the Holy Spirit came to live within us. Okay, our great comforter. And one of his main duties is working on us and changing us. Okay, uh, let's go into chapter 4. We're going to cover the first several verses. We've only got a few minutes left, but I think we can go over time without any great problem. Um, chapter 1, verse 4. Therefore, okay, he's drawing a conclusion. He's saying because of what we've just read, since because of what we've just learned, there are things that we need to do. Okay, what we have, have learned should make a difference. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, this wonderful ministry of God, of righteousness, this wonderful ministry of salvation, this wonderful ministry of life, okay? Seeing we have this ministry as, as we have received mercy, we faint not. You gentlemen are probably familiar with Lamentations chapter 3, I think it's verse 22 and 23, um, where among other things it says there that, that his compassions fail not and that his mercy is renewed every morning. Okay, God's mercy, His compassion, His love, His care for you and me never fails. Never fails. Mercy is always extended to you. If you have failed God, if you have been away from God, if you have not served God as you should have, if you don't love the Lord as you ought to, God's compassion, His mercy is still available for you. And 
you can change. You can be different. God wants to bless you. Okay, so as we have received, the seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We don't quit. Is the ministry tough? It can be. There are times of great blessing, but there are times of great trouble. And you gentlemen there in India, some of you may have suffered some, some serious persecution. Uh, persecution may be on the horizon right now. I don't know. Um, I know that there are periods of persecution in India, and there's some places that are more dangerous than others for believers. And, of course, this is true in many, many parts of the world. Um, but we don't quit. We don't give up. Paul, who wrote this, of course, had suffered many, many, many times being persecuted for Christ's sake, and ultimately he lost his life. He gave his life for Christ. Okay, so we don't quit, we don't faint, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, okay? We, instead of quitting, we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Now, he's talking here about things that nobody knows but you and God, okay? Things in your life, and beloved, every single one of us is still a sinner. You may have been saved for many years, but you still are, are a sinner. We, we're, we're all still sinners. There's not a Christian alive on the earth who doesn't have something in his life that he needs to correct. Okay? We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. A lot of Christians have things in their life that they're hiding from their brothers and sisters in Christ. But, beloved, nothing is hidden from God. Okay? Nothing is hidden from God. And so, we need to renounce those hidden things not walking in craftiness or handling the Word of God deceitfully, okay, not being deceitful, not being tricky, not having ulterior motives. Um, again, exactly how things go in India, I don't know, but I know in America there are quite a few preachers that are getting filthy rich, okay, and that doesn't make any sense. Um, there's one preacher that has an estimated net worth of something between 20 and 40 million dollars. I don't know how on earth a man can justify that kind of thing. If you've got that much wealth, then please give it to the Lord's work. Okay, give it away to missions. Give it away to small churches that are struggling. Uh, do something with it for Christ's sake. Win souls with that money. Don't sit there in a huge mansion with multiple cars and boats and that kind of thing. Okay, that is, that's crazy. I really think these men are deceitful. They're crafty. Uh, they're doing wrong. Um, are there some like that in India? I wouldn't be surprised if there are some. If Paul wrote this, bringing these things up in the first century, you and I know that it's going on around the world today. Okay, if it happened then, it happens now. So don't handle the Word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If we renounce the hidden things, the hidden agendas, the jealousies, the petty rivalries, the, the uh, being consumed with stuff, with things, being covetous, uh, if we renounce those things, those hidden things, then we manifest the truth. Okay, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. By living an upright, open, honest life, you manifest the truth of God. Okay, and he's talking here, I think we're going to get to it in just a moment, he's talking about the gospel. Okay, the next verse, but if our gospel be hid, you notice the contrast. Okay, renounce the hidden things. Instead, live a life that manifests the truth. But if we don't do that, then our gospel is hidden. 
okay, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world, the devil, Satan, that old dragon, the serpent, okay, he is blinding the minds of the lost. The Holy Spirit is illuminating their minds. The Holy Spirit is revealing the truth to them. He is convincing and persuading them of the truth of the gospel. The, the devil is doing his best to keep them blind. And then we've got Christian people in verse 2 and 3 who by living in hidden sin are keeping the gospel covered up. They're, they're hiding the gospel to the lost. Now, the number one way that Christians hide the gospel is by never giving it. There are millions and millions and millions of Christians in this world who've probably never won a single soul. That's a terrible thing. They often don't even win their own family. They have children, brothers and sisters and parents and grandparents and they never share the gospel. That's awful. They're hiding the gospel. Then there are others who might even be, you know, churchgoers and, you know, frequent churchgoers and that kind of thing, but the sin in their life is keeping God's blessing off of them. And so they're doing little, they're seeing little in the way of results because God can't use them, or at least not use them very often. Um, we don't need to be cooperating with the devil's work. The devil is keeping them blind and then we hide it. Okay, both by keeping our mouth shut and by living a fraudulent life. Okay, let's go on. Uh, we've got just a few more verses and then we'll be done for the day. Okay, verse 4 again, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So he has blinded the lost to the gospel, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, Satan is trying to keep them from understanding and believing the gospel, who is the Christ, is the image of God, and that his gospel should shine unto them. Okay, our business is making Christ to shine forth, making the gospel, we're, we're trying to shine a light in this world that they might come to Christ. Okay, um, Verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. There's a lesson here that an awful lot of preachers need to, to learn. It's not about you. Okay, we preach not ourselves. Preaching is not about you. Evangelizing is not about you. We preach Christ. We preach not ourselves, but Christ. It's not about us. Um, so many preachers are so consumed with what people think of them, with how many followers they've got, with are their church people loyal to them, um, all kinds of things of that nature. Um, and of course, how much they get paid and da 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 da, -da whatever. Um, but it's about Christ and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. Uh, we are servants of Christ, servants of God, and we're servants of the people. Okay, we need to be serving people. We serve the lost in giving them the gospel. We serve believers in leading them, guiding them, preaching and teaching to them, and so on. Okay, we serve. Um, I was talking to someone just the other day about the role of uh, an assistant or associate pastor and uh, the job really of any Christian is to do whatever is necessary for the Lord's work. Okay, whatever needs to be done. If it's digging a ditch, okay, if it's um, whatever it might be, cleaning toilets, um, if it needs to be done, we're not too big or too important to do it. Okay? So uh, we serve Christ. 
Um, verse 6, and two more verses. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Okay, God who said, let there be light. Back in the beginning, when everything was dark, and he said, let there be light. He has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay? We are to reflect Christ. We are to look like Christ. We are to act like Christ. We are, we are representatives of Christ. God, who created all things, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's, he's put the light in us, and our job is to manifest that light to the world. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure, okay? What is the treasure? the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which is in our hearts. The message of the gospel is a glorious treasure, a wonderful treasure that is capable of taking every single person on the earth to heaven. Most of them will not get there because they never hear or they hear and reject the message. But our job, our duty, is to take that message to them. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay, what's he saying there? He's saying that you and I are clay pots. Okay? We're just clay pots. A pot that you might carry water in, a pot that you might use as a storage container for, I don't know, for rice or whatever. Um, a clay pot not worth a whole lot. It's just made out of stuff that you dig out of the ground and a potter forms it into a vessel. Okay? We're just clay pots. Cost nothing hardly. Okay? But we contain the greatest treasure the world has ever known. The message of salvation. Okay? That's inside us. And then he says, and this is the point of all of this, this chapter here and the previous chapter, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay, remember, you're a clay pot, but you have a treasure inside you, and the power of God enables you to bring that treasure out and manifest it to the world. And the Spirit of God works through your preaching and your teaching and your personal individual witnessing and convinces people of the gospel. Not everyone gets saved, but if you give the gospel enough, some will get saved. And that's a wonderful thing. Okay, the excellency of the power. That's a marvelous phrase. The excellency of the power is not of us, but of God. Okay, what a wonderful thing. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much.